Um, so we're going to have a panel discussion about one and a half hours. Um, and I gave you a bit of a task to think through a little bit these issues about, you know, what kind of research questions are coming up here? I mean, we've been here now for two days. So a bunch of policymakers, researchers, a really nice group of people discussing all the opportunities and challenges of agriculture and the 2030 agenda. We have the SDGs coming up. And is there a role for research? Maybe it's just about politics now. Let's get rid of research and implement instead. And, you know, or are there fundamental research questions still out there? How many of you at all followed my instructions and actually did talk to someone and came up with a nice research question? Show your hands here. Okay, <laughs> good. So you, you are like, uh, you know, mostly like my colleagues in SCI when I give instructions, uh, and this is what happens. So that's fine. It means that you have still very open and free hands. We have an excellent panel. I, I will not introduce those that have been introduced a lot before. So Jim, he's still with us over there, uh, which is great. Uh, we have also Madeleine Oswald, and I say a few words about you because you have not been introduced before. Associate Professor, uh, Center for Environment and Sustainability and, and Center for Climate Science and Policy Research at Chalmers and Gothenburg University, and the Department of Thematic Studies Environmental Change at Linköping University. So three universities in one person. Can you imagine? That's really something. Uh, we have uh, Kostas with us, Stamboulis still, I introduced you before, and Margaret Kroma I have also introduced. John McDermott, you were speaking yesterday, so maybe we should remind people, even though you sh I don't think it's needed, but anyway, Director of uh, CGIR Research Program Agriculture for Nutrition and Health at IFPRI, uh, so based in Washington. And then we also have Ola Möller uh, from CIDA, an, an agronomist, senior policy specialist, unit for thematic support at CIDA, uh, and responsible in CIDA for the thematic areas of agriculture, forestry, fisheries, rural development, and food security. So a really small agenda uh, in terms of, of CIDA. But it's nice that everything is in one hand. Huh? Talk about you know, policy coherence and, and all that kind of things. It's amazing. I really like that. It uh, tells you about, you know, see that they really had to work hard, I must say. So we have one person representing three universities and one person from CEDA representing all these sectors. This say, tells you something about Sweden, doesn't it? Anyway, the instructions I've given the panel uh, is that our newcomers, they will be given an opportunity to reflect a little bit of what you've heard uh, over these days. You know, a couple of key points that you want to pick up, something that you found particularly interesting. Um, and then I will get back also to more on the issue of research questions looking at the 2030 agenda. And I will invite the audience quite a lot after these first 20, 20 minutes when you reflect a little bit. So we really get the discussions going. So since you didn't think about research questions during coffee, think about them a little bit now, but don't stop listening. So you have to do both, think and listen. It's very difficult, I know that. Anyway, why don't we start with you, uh, Madeleine? Um, so, some reflections from your side. So please grab a microphone there. Okay. Um, well, I think I've all actually attended all five conferences that have been here mm. at Agri for 40. So I can kind of give you an evolution of things. But I think one striking mm. thing to me has been, and maybe that's just the way I have listened to the, the talks that I have listened to, but there seems to come uh, things in themes in pairs or in, in coins with two sides. Mm -hmm. um, and I can just give you a few examples of the notes that I've taken. It's intensification versus underutilization. There is north and it's south, and there are entrepreneurs and cultural carriers, and there is short term and long term, and production and consumption. And I, there seems to be a lot of, and I think that's. Uh, an interesting new way of systematize themes that I, I kind of like. And I think I haven't heard it that much in the earlier mm. conferences. So I think that is kind of uh, one reflection that I have. Um, and of course, we have this whole thing of, of the theme, but I guess we're going to get back to the, the theme of the conference yeah, later, right? The okay. research questions, yeah. yeah, but then also I... I uh, I'm colored of what I've listened to, but I think also something that I don't think would have happened 
in the first conference is that we started talking about things like narratives and mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that's framings and things. And I think that's a kind of a, a new thing. Um, if we, yeah, some sort of evolution. And then, of course, I've listened to a lot of things that has to do with trees and multifunctionality, mm. and I like that, of course. Um, uh, and it has been presented in, in also in, in quite new ways, I think, in, in terms of more systematized or placed in, in new, mm. new ways. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll can, can stop I, If I can ask you a quick one, I mean, this tells you who, you know, me as a moderator, so don't try, you know, to get, to get away from just having a couple of comments and think that that's it. You say things in pairs. Is it versus or and? Is it, you know, wh wh where are we going in that? I think I it's both. I think some of them are linked mm -hmm. very closely, so there's a linkage between them. And some of them are presented as trade-offs. I mean, we ha here we have yeah. a, a thing, but we have this and we have that, and we mm -hmm. have to look at the trade-offs. So that could be a pro and con kind of a thing. Um, so I think you, you, I have seen both, I you think. Yes. Yeah. And, and also in terms, I li really liked what you said about narratives, more story sort of type. Um, would you say, what, what does that add? I mean, in terms of, of more of a, of a solution, doesn't it become very more vague and flimsy and, you know, what, you know, m stories? I, I have to Is give my scientific? compliment to the, to the people here that was at this session where huh? the, the ending discussion was on narratives. And I thought that the previous speakers that had talked about innovations and larvae and all kinds huh. of different things that they would feel in uncomfortable. But they, they had answers to this. They said, yeah, we are political animals here we we play this game uh, we're looking for objective uh, research in but we know that we're in a context that is very political mm. and i think they handled that very well i was afraid that it would be intimidating and that that and that all the natural scientists would feel uh, like pat patted on their heads but i i think they had very good answers so would you say that this whole issue of narratives m using that kind of methodology more, does it uh, help us in embracing complexity instead of having a very scientific where we have to bring every single sort of factor by its, you know, itself and talk about integration? Is it a way of embracing complexity? Yes. Good. <laughs> I just want to check. Whoa. You don't have to agree the others. I mean, you can come back to this. Ola, uh, if I... If I Turn over to you now. What, what would you say you have picked up uh, listening carefully here the, the last couple of days? Well, um, thank you. Well, I haven't, and this is my first uh, Agri 4D uh, conference attending, so I can't re reflect much uh, on history. But still, uh, I must say I've, I'm quite impressed. Um, I think the, the, the presentations I've been listening to has been very inspirational, actually, and, and I'm very happy that I was able to, to take part in this. Um, I think I've heard a lot about uh, interesting innovations, um, both in terms of research as well as methods for research. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been quite imp impressed, actually. Um, CEDA's policy for supporting uh, research is, is very clear on its priorities. Um, it's very clear that whatever research that we are supporting must be of high relevance for our partners, it must be of high relevance for poverty reduction, and it must be of high relevance for uh, sustainable development. And what I've seen and listened to here, I think, has been uh, scoring very high on all the, those three, three parts. Um, I also think that the discussions that have followed on, on the presentation has been very inform informative and, um, uh, yeah, as I said, given, given me a, a lot. Uh, I would like to maybe challenge you, the researchers here, the research community, a little bit, because one thing I think uh, I would like to see developed a bit more uh, is how, then, to take the, result, the results mm. of the research one step further, the innovations. How do we scale them up? How do we make sure that whatever is produced through research is then picked up, spread, and can, uh, and can contribute to reduce poverty and, and uh, contribute to sustainable development? I think unless we have scale up, we can't really say that we contribute 
to these uh, these big challenges that uh, the future uh, gives uh, uh, are having for us to solve. Um, at CEDA, we know that what, that um, this issue of taking an innovation and scaling it up, uh, making people to pick it up and, and use is quite difficult. It's, it's a challenge. Uh, and therefore, we have a few different tools to support this, one being something called a challenge fund, which is very similar to research funds. But this is geared towards entrepreneurs and innovators that come from the academic world or NGO world or private sector. And the purpose of this is to support that innovator or entrepreneur to um, not develop the product. The product must be ready for the market, but it's supposed to support the, 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 the innovator to take it to the market and make sure it has a potential to scale up. Mm. I don't think this is the only tool or the, only, the, the sort of silver bullet to solve this problem, but I think the issue of taking the innovations one step further and making it something that is scaled up is a, is a challenge that we face and where I think mm. The, the sort of the combined force of all these very bright minds here in the research community can really uh, make a difference for the future. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. You gave an example of how you tried to, you could say, facilitate um, almost um, uh, the connection between different actors in society because would you say that researchers are in general the entrepreneurs as well? Because what you said is, you know, we, I, you were missing a little bit that discussion here among, among the scientists, but isn't this two very different communities? Um, I think that a lot of researchers, uh, maybe I could say, I, I think a lot of researchers are entrepreneurs in the being, mm. so to say. There's a great potential. It's, it's a matter maybe of, of knowledge on how to take it the next step. It's not maybe the usual uh, business within the research community, and then uh, when you have a, a result of your research, to take it to the market or, ta or take it to, I don't know, the, the, the institutions or the policy makers or the decision makers mm. and work with them to make uh, this big uh, upscale take place. Mm. But I think the potential is very much there. And to it's more about finding how, how do we do it? Mm. And there I think research, researchers mm. can, can really do a lot. Play a role. I know I, p I put you on the spot here, so if you say, I want to think about that and answer later, you can do so. But is there anything you've li heard these last two days, which means that when you come back to see that, may I hope you take the day off tomorrow, but, but <laughs> on Monday, say on Monday, you know, I, yeah, I'm going to change certain things here. I, I did pick up a couple of things that, will, that would influence you, because this is what we try to do in conferences like this. We take researchers. We take people from different or international organizations. We try to influence policy. And you are one of those that we are trying to influence, of, of course, in mm. you know, mm. operating or thinking in different ways. Is there anything you take with you? Say, yeah, that's well, actually, I'm, I'm a bit biased. I, I believe in all what everyone has said here. <laughs> OK, good. So, so I, I see you on Monday. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> what, what my challenges are within CEDA is to convince people that focusing on rural development, uh -huh. agriculture, forestry, um, or rather the other way around, what the poor household faces in order to secure a safe and, and sound development. That's a huge challenge. And to convince my, part, uh, my, my colleagues at CEDA that we need to focus on establishing economic, sustainable, uh, in, in different uh, sustainable development in different aspects, economical, uh, mm. cultural, uh, environmental, and so on, development in the rural areas to be able to meet the, f the, the challenges of, of um, uh, the Agenda 20, uh, 2030 and so on. Mm. Uh, and uh, to answer your question with a long answer, <laughs> um, a lot of the presentations here, I've been very busy writing down, taking photos of the uh, PowerPoint presentations, so I've taken a lot of information with mm. me that, that will support uh, sort of my case at within CEDA. But it's nice because you gave ex partly the answer that I, that I was expecting, to, to be honest. The fact that, you know, it, it's not convincing you, but you have a challenge to convince the organization. We talked many years in Sweden, the fact that, for instance, ODA, Swedish ODA, doesn't prioritize agriculture, rural development enough. Yeah. So it's, uh, I understand that this, there is an issue. You need arguments. Yes. Mm. John. I don't, well, if you want to reflect a little bit on, on what you've heard maybe today and so on, please feel free to do so. But otherwise, the idea is also to move over a little bit to 
you know, looking at the future, we, on Sunday we will have the SDGs, uh, I mean, we will have the climate, uh, hopefully, agreement in December, you know. What are the resource questions really remaining uh, in order to get yeah. these changes? So, so let me start with a couple of reflections yeah, please. on what I've heard. Um, and they relate to the overall agenda of the kind of post-2015 development agenda and the role of science. So one is, and it, it struck me quite a bit in the panel session this afternoon, is you know, when you get to tricky issues like youth employment and things like that, you know, what's the role of government? How do different actors in society, mm -hmm. what's the kind of whole of society approach to looking mm -hmm. at this? Um, you know, in low and middle income countries, obviously government plays a huge role, uh, much more than in rich countries. Um, and other parts of, of society are less engaged and less, less able maybe in some ways. Um, I think that's changing fast but, and, and varies from country to country and in some places government's really weak. Um, so, so this kind of whole of society approaches, what does that look like? And then that leads to the reflection we as, as a kind of science group or a science community, what, how, what role do we play in that? Um, and we've seen that the kind of how science is viewed and how scientists are viewed has changed a lot in a lot of places. Um, you know, scientists used to be kind of whatever they said, you know, they were the experts. So, you know, that expert knowledge. And f fortunately, we're in a place now where that's no longer the case and we're providing evidence and, and that gets combined with other types of information and knowledge, which is fine. Um, I think you know, there's a bit of discrediting of scientific evidence that we need to shore up. Um, and th I think this is inevitable. So we look at kind of scientific methods and how they work, and we're finding, you know, there's been major exposures in the last decade and important journals like Nature and Science, et cetera, of, of the weakness of some of our evidence and how they can't be reproduced or, or, you know, there's all kinds of systematic biases, certainly in public health right now, for example, we're finding out that a lot of the clinical trials we do, they're very correct, but they're not showing the complete population of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that get left out because they're not favorable or whatever are really biasing our knowledge of, of what's working. So we really need to tighten up on the evidence. I think there's gonna be dramatic changes in what that looks like in the next few years. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned yesterday, I think statistics is gonna be turned, turned on its head. I mean, the kind of the classic frequentist statistics that we learned is, is out. Uh, we're gonna be using more big data, we're gonna be using more Bayesian approaches of revising priors, uh, a lot more simulation and other things. I think that's all very healthy and that's, that's gonna, so there's the quantitative side that needs to improve and then be linked with mm. the narratives and stories and other things we heard to get a much richer picture of what goes on. Um, now, so, so that's just a, a bit on evidence and kind of, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Now the, the next question is, and it came up a lot, I, you know, I was very impressed with what I heard because obviously, uh, you know, if you're a young person starting out in science, you've got a pretty defined project usually. It's not, you know, looking at the whole of decision making in a country or something like that. It's, it's a very specific thing, but I, I saw people considering the broader context, what the implications were. I was very impressed that way, and, and I, I don't think we would have seen that four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. so, so that's very positive, um, which leads to some of the fundamental questions, which are not just questions about what should be done or what intervention should be made, but how to do mm -hmm. them. And that brings me to kind of what some of the scientific gaps are. Um, better knowledge about behavior, choice, trade-offs. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a lot of progress in economics in recent years, um, in, in various fronts, and including people who have been given important prizes on the commons and, and you know, kind of psychology as part of economics, et cetera, behavioral economics. I think that's all gonna be important. I think we talked about narratives and stories, linking that up with future scenarios, good mm -hmm. modeling is going to be important, the kind of mixing of qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. The other, I think, fundamental problem in our decision making is 
things we can't value, we call them externalities, mm -hmm. and we kind of wave our hands over them, and that's getting us into all kinds of trouble. So improving valuation, you know, kind of raising the bar of evidence across the board so that we can have good discussions about important things and not just about what we're measuring. Yeah. So it's not just that science is lo like a drunk looking for his keys under the lamppost because that's what we see. We, we need to expand our methods and even if they're imperfect, we have to look in the dark and, mm. and, and try and answer important questions even if we don't answer them very well to begin with. That's so great. Those are some of my reflections of, and it's not often I get to sit or, and listen to a bunch of stuff um, all the time without having to talk all the time. So I, I really appreciated the fact that I got to speak first and then largely listen to other people for a couple of days. That's wonderful. Can I, can I just very, very briefly ask you, I mean, you, you are uh, working at IFPRI, you are part of the CGIR system. You, what you're talking about are quite fundamental changes in a way, uh, how science is operating and, and working and how you mix different disciplines and, and so on. Do you see this uh, trend in, in, in IFPRI? or in the CGIR, or is it too um, yeah. stiff and... Um, so, l let me just answer the question with respect to IFPRI, and I'm, I'm relatively new at IFPRI, mm. so I can't tell you how much IFPRI's changed. I can tell you my impressions of moving to IFPRI from other research institutes. And, um, you know, most of us would think of IFPRI as an organization largely of economists, but there's quite a few natural scientists there now. There's engineers, mm. there's um, social, a lot more social science, etc. So it's changed its mix. Um, the two things have uh, impressed me that I wasn't expecting at IFPRI, I guess. Um, one is that um, it's really got, in its relationship with different countries, a very demand-led process. Mm. Um, and this started about 10 or 15 years ago when they set up a kind of approach where they would embed small teams into different countries. Mm -hmm. And they've really got that as a kind of demand-led process um, where you can mix the kinds of evidence that IFPRI works with building up the champion teams of the analysts in the countries with as answering questions mm -hmm. that people pose. And so I, th I think that's been very interesting and it was a bit unexpected for me. Um, the, the second thing is that, um, and we do a lot of work on evaluation mm -hmm. of interventions and different things, was the insights into process evaluation or how to do things, not just on what works and what doesn't work. And so a lot, a lot of those dynamics are there, are so, th so that's been good. I mean, obviously there's weaknesses in any kind of approach and system, and in a sense maybe Part of it isn't that we have to reform every institution, it's the institutional arrangements and the linkages mm. between institutions of different strength. And, and in a sense, that's what I'm looking to as a kind of outsider to IFPRI is to help to, to IFPRI to see what are the opportunities mm. for working with other people. Thanks, that's great. Because I know Costas, I mean, you talked about the governance of the public uh, sort of public research system as well. So it, it was just interesting, I mean, in a way to see if the governance, if the structures we have in place are actually flexible enough you know, in a way to actually respond to some of these quite rapid changes that you're talking about. So it, it was interesting to just get your reflection on that. Uh, Margaret, maybe though we can move, can I move to you first uh, and maybe get some of your reflections in terms of um, the issue of research uh, for the 2030 agenda. I mean, you highlighted quite a few things in, in your presentation, but if you take that one step further, what, what is it that you specifically think we need as we move forward? I think so. Let's okay. Yeah, um, there you go. <laughs> well, uh, I think what if I, you know, kind of reflect on a similar a conference of this nature, say five, six years back, mm. in agriculture, looking at the way forward in the goal of looking at the goal of science in agriculture or in uh, contributing to development on the ground, the focus would really be perhaps maybe eighty percent of the time looking at the technology, mm. what needs to be understood, what knowledge needs to be generated to ensure that a technology really works and transforms change on the ground. That would have probably be a large part of the discussion. Mm. What I sensed and what I, 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 I experienced today, very, very refreshing really, was um, not just focusing on 
um, just the, the innovation, the technology, but really looking at the context within which those innovations are play out and the, some of the consequences. Um, uh, in the, some of the presentations on, on livestock and not just focusing on what livestock research can contribute, but what are some of the other externalities and how to bring that into the, dis, into the, the research agenda, I thought mm -hmm. was very, very uh, refreshing. Um, I thought, you know, this, the, the challenge moving forward um, when we look at the role of science is historically there's been a, 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 well, a reluctance to really bridge that domain between the uh, scientific research and the world in which policies and actions take place and are informed by that research. Mm. And so it's, it's a refreshing to begin to see conversations about an emerging research agenda around discourse, discourse analysis, recognizing that, yes, technology works, but the context within which it works is a very contested context, mm. it's a very messy context, and that there can be co-optation of ideas and are uh, used to pursue or drive interests that may or may not be in the interest of those stakeholders on the ground for which, for whom they are intended. So that whole healthy conversation that is interrogating that space between science, uh, between scientific technology and the world in which it is applied, mm. and really trying to understand it, not to make judgments, but to understand. Because you know um, what it does is begin to challenge us as researchers to ask ourselves, what's the limit of our responsibility or accountability for the science we generate. Um, it is very comfortable to stand and say, well, we are scientists, we're not supposed to be messing in that world out there. We do the science, we generate it, and what happens to it, that shouldn't really be mm. our responsibility. But as we talk about dealing with these huge challenges around sustainability, I think there is a role of, of communication for scientists to ensure that their message, their innovations out there are really communicated to the great diversity of stakeholders from the bottom up mm. so that there is awareness and understanding of the implications of the risks and opportunities of co-optation of those innovations. Mm -hmm. I believe that's a whole new terrain. It is not a very comfortable uh, zone for, for scientists, but sh I, I think it is something to to, to reflect on in mm. terms of the future in looking at the whole question around post-2015 development agenda and the role of science. Mm. Not to meddle in, in, in the world out there, but to really be taking a clear stance in terms of communicating science to a lay audience who understand when and uh, when uh, narratives are being re-articulated in ways that they can reject mm. or can say, yes, I think I, I understand this. So for those are some of the, um, um, the kinds of you know, reflections that I take away. Then particularly, I was also very interested that there's a lot of, there was a lot of reflection around some of the institutional elements mm around our science. Too often we don't go too far into those things. We, we, we focus so much on, on good technology. And yes, technology works. It, it is important for science to generate new ideas, new knowledge that inform innovations that can drive change. Mm. But to also understand what are the kinds of institutional arrangements that need to be in place. The whole questions around you know, tenure issues. Mm. Um, the whole questions around functioning you know, markets, about governance. Uh, we talked about, you know, Paul, uh, the whole, you know, recognition that in many developing countries, we have very terrible systems of governance, uh, very undemocratic institutions. So that uh, within such context, what are the, the, the spaces for possible kinds of engagement mm. to occur? Is there a role for really educating, creating awareness of local community institutions so that they can hold you know, uh, decision makers and policy makers accountable. Mm. Are there opportunities for these kinds of spaces? So it's great, very exciting discussion that is cutting across different walls of science, I think, uh, very healthy. Which is interesting. I mean, the last part you're talking about where there is a need for science in a way, but in a very political mm -hmm. arena, which yeah. is in itself complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, the whole, I don't know who I was talking to sometime, either yesterday or today, and we're talking about, you know, um, the, 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 the next step, the final, the last mile, what I like to call the last line. In other words, scaling up. How do these innovations really make a difference in a world that we recognize is so murky? And that there has, we need not reinvent 
the wheel. Mm. That learning is part of the process of knowledge, mm. generation and discovery. There's been societies in different geographies mm. and different historical moments who have gone through the kinds of issues we're talking about. How, what worked? Mm. What were the models of engagement at different levels that were transformative? Mm. How could those models inform? That's a whole arena of research mm. in, in looking at uh, what had worked mm. across you know, uh, these uh, uh, science innovations in Thank the you. world and learn from those. Thank you, yes. Costas, I mean, FAO has been around for a long time. It, you should have a wealth of information what works and what doesn't work. You don't need to respond to that, but please provide your reflections. It would be nice to hear maybe later, you know, what are the lessons learned. What are your reflections? And also, in t I mean, in terms of what are the science questions out there? Uh, can FAO play a role in that as well? Um, uh, hopefully. Hopefully. You have a new strategy in place. Let, let so. me start from the beginning, yeah. right? Let, let's look a Ooh. little bit about the, the title of this conference is oh. Agriculture for Food Security Post-2015. Yes. The role of science. It's like there is a break in 2015, <laughs> and then from 2015 on we are in a different world, different challenges, etc. Rather than looking at this as a continuing process of learning what we did right, what we did wrong, and, you know, get a few things... Um, Get, get, get a few things to do better. So I, I don't want to diminish the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals or any other, um, let's say, commonly agreed frameworks, which at the end of the day provide the basis of, for accountability, for political pressure, for... Um, th these are very useful things, mm. right? And, and there are commitments, let's say, at regional level mm. relating to hunger that are more ambitious than the, the, than the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which is the, the Latin America and Caribbean without hunger by 2015, the Malabo Declaration in Africa, mm. etc. Those things are not to be taken lightly that they're pieces of paper, etc. As I said, there are commitments, they create mm. accountability, somebody can take them and run with them, etc. So, uh, so it's a process. Actually, I just looked at, at something that was written by somebody that left disgust at the UNDP called uh, Varde Mutele. I don't know if you guys know him. He wrote a calm look at the sustainable development goals, and I would be very happy to share it with all of you. It's a couple of pages thing. The guy was a coordinator of the MDGs in the beginning, mm. but then he got totally uh, disenchanted and left the uh, UNDP. Now, uh, so th that, that's the first thing. I mean, the, the continuity, it's not that the world changed uh, from one day to another. Some of the reflections from this conference, yeah. right? First of all, I want to congratulate people that put their hands on innovative things, which you never know where they're going to lead. They may lead to nothing. Mm. They may not be able to be scaled up. There is a lot of questions. And some of them have to do with natural science, which I understand very little, but I understood enough to know that those things are, you know, experimental. And so people invest time, etc., which may not, the youth, um, business that, uh, that uh, Jim, it's, it's something that if you want to get some results, you have to invest from the beginning in data, in conceptual frameworks, that's mm. there. I also want to congratulate people that put their hands on some of the issues that researchers may consider passé because they don't sell anymore. Let me give you this one. Um, session two yesterday here, uh, transforming subsistence farming into commercial enterprises. There are two two aspects of this. One was, I mentioned it here, that, that in, in some presentations, um, farmers were uh, considered as farmers and nothing mm. else. So livelihoods were single, you know, activity-based. Mm. But that, that the other one was uh, looking at the whole issue of um, the relationship between the commercialization of agriculture and traditional tenure structures. Mm like um, communal uh, or so, uh, societal structures. And this is an issue of the 70s and the 80s, right? But it comes back uh, with full force when uh, people realize that agriculture may be actually a good place to make money, right? The, and, and so they started looking at it. So having the, the courage to look at some mm. old issues in a new framework, it's, I think it's, it's, it's an excellent uh, commitment mm. to... To, to, to relevance. Um, so this is some of the impressions from, from this conference. The second point is 
What did you say? Well, the second point is more, I mean, you have a chance to maybe give one or two reflections on, in terms of, of research. Um, right. And the role of research. Okay. I mean, partly you did, you know, be persistent, uh, actually, right. because... I think, yeah. I think I expressed some of the views um, in my presentation, ah. right? Yeah. Whereby um, the, the, we, uh, the, the whole issue of, of um, food security, et cetera, is, a, is a, an increase in complexity. Mm. There is an increase in complexity in the targets, right? In the past, we were talking about caloric deficiency as a major measure. And now you have, I think I counted 16 countries that they suffer from triple burden of malnutrition. I wanted to present this slide, it's very interesting. So you have countries that are, they have a combination of stunting and, and nutritional deficiencies. Um, and then you have countries that have both of those plus obesity, the triple mm. burden. 16 yeah. countries have all of this together in high prevalence, right? So the whole issue of nutrition is becoming mm. complex. The targets, the metrics have to change. The second is investment is not investment anymore, right? Uh, you, you can, it's not enough to say if there is underinvestment in agriculture, which causes a whole bunch of other things, mm. right? Investment includes the large scale investments in agriculture mm. coming from domestic or foreign uh, institutional investors and others, right? So there is a, e even in the things that we consider resolved, there is, a, there is an added complexity. Climate change, mm. of course, everybody mentions it and I will do, so people don't think that I, I, I'm ignorant. Uh, climate change <laughs> well, is you're a skeptic because if you don't mention complexity it. on it and we don't know <laughs> exactly, etc. And then we, in the research community, as I said before, and in the governance of food security yeah. and nutrition, we have an increasing participation of actors. And the question is, um, I think Jim mentioned that in uh, Africa there is a stable, uh, there, there is non-increasing um, funding of research and development, which I think is probably a, re a real reduction, but whatever it is. So the question is, what is a strategy for the public sector Right, research in this context. Mm. W how do, um, what is the process by which research priorities are being mm. set? Okay. So it's a matter of, it's, it's not only the individual research issues that my friends here from research institutions and universities are more capable, but the, what is the process by mm. which um, it's uh, the, the public research uh, and development uh, agenda is set, the priorities? This is a, a very interesting question. Okay. Okay, thanks. I, I think, you know, let's stop there because actually I gave them two minutes each. That's the instruction. So, a bit longer, but that's okay in the first round. But, we, you know, in the next round when you get uh, questions as well, I will push you a little bit. But Jim, uh, you also have a chance to, to reflect a little bit on, on, on the conference, but also on some of the research questions that are coming right. up. Um, I think I'll take my two minutes. And I want to do this by making a link between a comment that Ola made and a comment that uh, Madeline made. So, um, Madeline, you said that you, what you thought was different in this conference to some previous ones, that you'd heard people talking about framings and narratives, that maybe that wasn't so common previously. And Ola, you raised the question about scaling up and mm -hmm. uptake. Mm -hmm. And I think we can link those two, because they're quite important. So, it strikes me that much of the research that we've heard reported on, especially and particularly that from the research students, has been research that has been really questioning and interrogating quite fundamental social processes yeah. mm -hmm. and physical, biological processes as well. So it's research that deals with concepts and that interrogates those concepts. Mm. It's research that deals with frameworks and interrogates and critiques those frameworks. It's research that deals with theory. And the outputs from those that research is new knowledge. Mm. It's new and better concepts, new, new knowledge. And it's not so straightforward to say, how do we take that and scale it up? But I think if we take a slightly longer view, we can, we can bring those two together. Because of course, one of the ways that new knowledge and new concepts get scaled up is through new framings mm, okay. and new discourse and new narratives. And of course, those new framings and those new, the new discourse and the new narratives they change the game. They change how people think about problems. They change how people fund problems and what kind of uh, implementation goes on and so on. So I guess my plea would just be that if, if uh, research funders 
or like CETA, can see a kind of a broader view of what scaling up is. So scaling up is just as important in the, in the, in the, in the discourse and in the framings as it is in terms of taking your product, product mm. and moving it to market. That may be a longer term process, it may be a process that's harder to get your hands on, but in fact, in the long term, it's the process that's really gonna change the game. And it goes back, I think, to your question, Johan, where you said, what's the role of research or is it all about politics? But in fact, I would suggest that one important role of research is to understand the politics, mm. and particularly to understand the politics of the policy process, because mm. that's what's really gonna drive change. Margaret uh, said that you know, researchers need to be more involved, if I interpret you a little bit freely, in, in sort of society. And, I mean, you said you know, in terms of communication, reaching out and really working with stakeholders. Is, is, that, is that what you're asking also in terms of you know, changing the paradigms, changing the frameworks? Is that, is that uh, what, what we need to do? Yes, I think so. I, I think it's, it, it, is, it is very much about that. And, and change new framings, new ways of thinking about problems, what's in and what's out, new narratives, i.e. that support certain kinds of policy mm. action, those are really, really important. Mm. And if we, if, you know, in the longer term, again, it's a longer term game where research about fundamental problems, about fundamental processes, <laughs> plays into that process of changing framings, changing narratives, mm. changing discourse. I think it's really, really critical. Mm -hmm. Ola and Madeleine, I will give you a chance now also to reflect a little bit on the, on the research questions before we come back. And Ola, I mean, if I can just throw back the question to you, you, you know, I mean, you talk about the Grand Challenge Fund, you talk about, you know, we have to, to, to upscale, we have to you have entrepreneurs really taking, uh, you know, research ideas to solutions that work in the ground. Isn't there a risk that, uh, you know, funders like CEDA become too narrow-minded and, and lose track of, of what Jim is talking about here, which are more sort of fundamental changes? And maybe is this because the way you are evaluated today? I mean, you have to measure very clearly again what the outputs and outcomes and impacts and happiness and whatever is for everything you do. What are the challenges there for you to actually be more part of that agenda as well? Yeah. Well, um, I only had two minutes before. Yes. So <laughs> I had to focus on a few things. But um, of course, you're, you're ab absolutely right. Um, the example I, I, I gave here, uh, maybe it sounded like it's, it's rather a narrowly focusing way of supporting innovation. Uh, uh, that's not the case. Of course, as a donor, um, the important thing is, of course, the strategic development. It's not find, uh, funding a small technical tool in your hand that can be, be sold in, in tens or hundreds or so on. That's not uh, the, the change that we are looking for. So um, I would rather say we, it's, it's different levels. I think uh, very, very important is also for research to contribute to policy change, to contribute to making uh, decision makers who are not that much put into the picture in our world, so to say, to realize what are the important things, where should we focus, who should we work with, what are the uh, priorities. And there we are very, very interested in, in, in supporting these mm. changes in, in opinions, changes in, in behavior, policy change and, and so on. Is this, is this, <coughs> now, is this more difficult to sell? In, in, I mean, I'm, I'm coming to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think CEDA is not alone in having uh, received quite, um, quite a lot tougher demands of us, uh, on us as a donor organization to provide results to our political um, um, masters, so to say, those who give us the, the, the instruction mm. on how we work, what we work with, and who we are responsible mm. to sh report back to. The demand on our, uh, us donors, not only CEDA, but I think among most donors, have been uh, a lot more precise that we need to be much more able to show concrete results, basically ticking boxes and, mm. and writing numbers in, 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 uh, in tables and so on. This has been done for the Swedish taxpayers' money. I think that is, uh, it's a relevant demand on us. And I think uh, at the same time, this has meant um, it's much more difficult to assess a process than just producing 10 examples of, of a specific technical toy, so to say. So it's much more difficult to assess and show that this support to this process, this policy development, has shown results that we can 
uh, be assured to show in concrete figures to our uh, political decision makers mm. that this has really happened. And, and this is actually something I want to share with you. If we can together work through research on how this can be, uh, th this support, these development of processes uh, in order to have sustainable development, how this can be evidence, so to say, uh, that will help us as a donor um, to support such processes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a bit maybe uh, not so precise in my response, but, but it's a very difficult matter. No, and I, and I think it's not interesting. I talked this morning with, with the, the Green uh, Climate Fund, for instance, also the head of the Green Climate Fund, and they, I mean, they, all of us struggle with the same, same problem because we all realize that it's not about, you know, investing in one dam or in, it's it's a, you know systemic investments which are much more hard so as mm -hmm. you say you know research should also try to support the development of appropriate monitoring system assessment systems uh, indicators etc that actually can capture this mm -hmm. i think it makes a lot of sense and i i personally uh, appreciate that CEDA accepts success stories as an indicator rather than sometimes having you know just mm -hmm. numerical tables so madeleine wh what is your perspective here um, well, if I should somehow represent uh, the pure s scientific um, actor here, I have to say, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give us all the tasks that is needed to get a sustainable development. I mean, we, I'm hearing here now that we should be able to communicate better, we should be more entrepreneurial. Uh, I mean, we have a hard time to handle our disciplines and getting in front of, 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 of the top-notch science that we're in. So I'd like to, to see it more as a collaborative thing. Please help us, guide us. Who should we talk to and when should we talk to whom? Are we, we, this is a, a problem. And, mm. and give us the uh, investors and entrepreneurial uh, contacts if that is what we need. But don't put that on our agenda. Uh, and I, I just like to say also say that the linkage between science and policy is so non-linear, and uh, the causality of mm. a process in a policy event is so hard to to say that this is due to that kind of scientific evidence. Mm. And I just to give you the the pressure that sometimes are put on us. I finished a project for a Swedish. Uh, a uh, department, uh, I'm not going to mention which one, a few years back, and I sent in the report in the, in the last of December, and I was very happy. We had produced a lot of good science, a lot of papers, we had plenty to show for, and I got a response that they wanted me to highlight what policy process that we had mm. informed. And, and they asked that two weeks after the, the project was finished. And, and that's kind of the, to show you a little bit, the naive thinking of what we can do as scientists. Mm. So I just like to say that let's work together to get this, but it's not a scientific task to do all those things. Mm. It's a very good point. If you get that question, you should only respond all of them. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I know, it's just easy, you know, then what? <laughs> Uh, Kostas, if it's a very short one, because now I really would like to get people in here. So Two points. One is exactly what you mentioned. What is the theory of change for research uh -huh. at the end of the day? And what is the theory of change for FAO? This, that's, I think there are two. Mm. Th that's one much to think. And I hope we get into the discussion on how do we, who is responsible and how in translating the results of science into the policy process. I mean, th that, because that's... The whole point about the SDGs, if we are going to do anything with it. Second, some of us are here from public institutions. What is the process by which those public institutions absorb innovation? Because we talk a lot about it, mm. but what, do we have a process by which innovation is recognized, is um, taken in, is processed, and then it's being applied? This is an interesting question. It's interesting. And I mean, Hopefully I, they won't ask me. But, uh. <laughs> but if I can just make a very brief comment on your first point, I, I think it's interesting also from my own perspective. In SCI, we, we try to control the entire process. We have research. We also work a lot with policies. Do you control it? But I can see many, I mean, the, the, the sort of general structure is that scientists, they produce science. And then, as you say, others, intermediaries, take that science and turn it into policy. 
This is what many think tanks do, for instance. But then you can see a big, big risk also, because they can sometimes also have their own agenda. So how do you deal with the fact that actually, you know, others are using your science for a very specific purpose that was not the intention? I'm just adding a couple of, you know, wood into the fire here. Anyway, so let's see what people are boiling here. So we have one, two, raise so I can get a feeling. You have papers and pencils, so you take notes and then you comment on, you know, various things. You don't need to comment on everything and try to stick to one minute in your comment. So let's start there and then we have the lady there as well. So start. Hello, can yes? you hear me? Where are you? I'm here. There, good. <laughs> I'm Gunn Eriksson Skog. I, I have one foot in research and I have one foot in, in development. I'm currently with SIDA. I would like to pick up on the last discussion on the linkages between research and, and policy makers and practitioners. Um, I, I have no solution uh, to the problem. I recognize the problem. I have experienced the problem. Uh, I think one needs to recognize that to to perform a bridging function from research to policy and practice and vice versa, um, that takes particular resources, that takes a particular function. Maybe uh, you can do that within a research institute uh, where you combine both, um, or, or research and policy institute. And, um, but I think one needs to recognize researchers will always focus on research and they have to focus on their research mm. career, whatever, in development, we, we're busy doing our things. Mm. We would like to, 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 to get access to research, but we never have time to read the research reports. So we want, we want uh, 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 research results translated into implications for policy. Uh, in few words and so forth. So, so recognize that this is a particular function that needs to be performed and resources and people um, performing that. And then I have uh, another reflection um, from the discussions and that from, in particular from one, one uh, session. I just want to mention it. I, I'm not quite sure what it means, but when we were talking about livelihoods uh, and we were a mix of people and uh, I'm not sure uh, w what everybody comes from, the, uh, we were talking, uh, having different perspectives on, on what livelihoods means. Does it mean continuity or does it mean mm. change? Um, a lot of people tended, in my view, to see, to see that as sort of preserving, mm. yeah. continuing uh, status quo, whereas others, including myself, saw, <laughs> saw livelihoods more as requiring change because of poverty, uh, uh, or poor livelihoods and so on. Um, that's just an issue I want to raise, but possibly uh, related to that is the third issue raised by Jim, um, where I was inspired by you when you said, when we talked about the fu uh, future of agriculture for youth. I'm not sure that there are not good uh, processes going on within commercialization of, of, of agriculture that sort of is more, more inclusive process. I think there are examples and so on, but you asked, why haven't we seen any major structural change of agriculture, which of course is a, it's been on the agenda for decades. And, and that is a very important question. <laughs> um, and so I think we need to ask, what is the reason for why these changes that we all uh, think are necessary are not taking place? Mm -hmm. So we need to look into precisely what was discussed here, the policy process, the political interests and, and powers behind that, and uh, sort of what is the resistance to change, but then of course also to identify what are the drivers of mm. change. Excellent, so a number of questions there, thank you very much. On your first observation, I mean you have SLU Global and you have Ciani, so you have these perfect actors uh, being in between there. So let's take... Uh, Yes, please there, and then we have the gentleman there. So please, and that's up here. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Catherine from U Makere University Business School, Uganda, and uh, I want to first of all thank the organizers. I think to me this was great, but I'm looking at how research can inform development, especially in the case of Africa and specifically Sub-Saharan Africa. I think it gives us a challenge if I speak as a researcher as an academia, the challenges of Africa seem to be multidisciplinary. We have a socially embedded kind of situation where economic decisions are not necessarily going to be solved probably by a linear kind of 
of model uh, that, that is characteristic of the researches that are being carried out. And uh, from the research point of view, it means we may have to reflect on how research is being conducted. Uh, mm. Like she mentioned, you, you tend to follow a specific pathway to, to attain your career path. But I think if we are going to really inform development and policy, we may need to look at probably multidisciplinary teams because during the discussions, you would ask someone, did you go ahead to find out the social characteristics of these farmers? So, no, no, that was outside the scope. I think if we are going to inform really development, we have to be able to, to extend our boundaries in that kind of area and probably look at non-conventional research methods and uh, like, for example, in-depth studies, we need to look at exper experimental designs at the project level because you find you're funding a research for six months, you go to the field and collect the data for two weeks. I mean, it's, it's literally meaningless because, yes, you'll have findings, you'll have all the statistics you need, but mm. in terms of significantly informing policy and development, it's like uh, probably not sufficient. And I think John mentioned something on scaling up. Uh, when I look at what is happening back home, probably experimental designs would, in agriculture, if it is a business model, if it is an innovation, can we look at research that is more practical, mm. not the laboratory kind of, uh, I'm not, I have nothing against the laboratory scientists, but we need to move out to the communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you, if you can keep them a bit shorter, the intervention is okay, but it's still nice to get the reflections in here. But this is more of a dialogue. We had the gentleman there, and then we had one also up there, two up there. So let's take these three first. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm Mark. I'm an exchange student here at SLU. I'm from uh, Canada, and I'm still a bachelor student. Um, so I'm going to go with one question and one comment. Uh, my question is uh, that usually politics are built on a short-term scale, but often the results of study or mm -hmm. idea that we build after study are, uh, needs a long-term schedule, uh, like uh, job creation like Jim speak about, or uh, like all the agroforestry that uh, Margaret speak about. I mean, we need long-term projects. So how uh, do we, or you, as a scientist, like, uh, can you um, influence the politics to long to look at long-scale uh, project? Mm. Um, so that was my question. And as a comment, I was kind of surprised uh, that uh, Madeline, you were saying that um, the the role of scientists was not so much to uh, kind of influence the the politics that you should st uh, stick more to your uh, science, so like science point of view. Uh, I was kind of thinking the opposite because um, I don't see really how the politician uh, should be able to use the scientist's work if they don't have like the specific knowledge to uh, understand like specific field uh, in which you've done your study. Hmm. Um, Good. So it's coming back to that question, which is also back to the first one. Is it the role of scientists or is it the role of others, uh, again, you know, to support that transformation or that transition of knowledge and so on? So let's go back to that, Madeleine, and you can, you can discuss it further. We have two more comments in the back, and then we take over the panel, please. Okay. Hi, my name is Johannes. I'm an agroecology student here at SLU. Um, and I had a question which is a little bit about uh, the diversity of which you, Costas, mentioned of uh, family farms and small farms. And uh, then later on in your presentation, you were talking about extension service and uh, advisory services. And I would like to ask the question, how, how should uh, the future extension service be designed to really uh, take into account um, this diversity? And uh, what is the role of science within that, uh, well, agricultural knowledge system? That would be, yeah, it's interesting. I think it was you, Costa, saying that this has basically collapsed in the world. So it's, uh, if I recall, uh, maybe more dramatic than what you said. But anyway, so let's take the final question in the back. Uh, my name is Albert. Uh, I'm a researcher here at SLU, at Department of Energy and Technology. My question is uh, directed particularly to 
uh, Jim. Um, yes, um, he, the, the, his topic was, uh, is agriculture the sweet spot for youth employment in Africa? Um, yes, and it is a yes and a no um, uh, answer. In that, uh, uh, my question to him is, how do we address the issue of uh, producer prices? You see, that is the central point. That is the major problem that we have uh, that is there in Africa. There is, there is, the tendency is that there is lower producer prices and also the prices uh, um, uh, of most of the cash crops tends to, the, tends to, to fluctuate. And that fluctuation of prices uh, you know, has a tendency of affecting the product, uh, you know, the zeal or the, the interest to get into the field of agriculture. So most of the youths, because they are looking at good jobs, as you have mentioned, uh, you know, this question of producer prices, you know, destroys or, or it kills their interests in the, in the, in the field. Then just, just a, a short comment on the issue of... Um, uh, the, the relationship between science and, 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 and politics, I feel and strongly feel that uh, the scientists should also uh, take into account the fact that uh, uh, science is, is affected heavily by politics depending on the communities in which mm. this uh, science is to be applied. Uh, it is really a function of uh, politics and religion because uh, they, they are a number of you know, things that happen behind closed doors or behind, uh, you know, after uh, science has come up with results. Someone else, uh, you know, the, you know, the way the most people in some communities, I'm not saying in all communities, in some communities, the way other people then interpret it would be wrong because of those that I, they, they are in touch with. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think, I mean, the final point is quite interesting, going back also a little bit to you, Madeleine. Um, uh, you know, the fact that, okay, we don't get involved in politics, but if politics doesn't understand science, they also may make the wrong decisions about what kind of science they need. So in a way, it's uh, communicating sort of <laughs> between each other a little bit. So it's an interesting point that, that you're making there. A lot of things, uh, clearly, you know, how do we have, what, what kind of bodies do we have to translate science to policy? the transformative changes that we talked about in agriculture, why is it happening, what are the problems there, understanding certain terminology, I think that was interesting, livelihood, what does it mean, sustainability, whatever. We heard in the session before the, the lunch about sustainable intensification, which could obviously be interpreted in a very positive way, in a very negative way, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, the multidisciplinarity, which is key, uh, do we have that capacity, do we need to develop it? Um, non-conventional research methods, uh, experimental design, the whole issue of scaling up came back also, the politics, the problem with short-term gains versus long-term, it came back also in the discussion about agroforestry that we had before. How do we get politics that actually are more long-term because they don't see the gains in short terms? And then the extension services and how does the future look there and what kind of science do we need? And you get about a minute each to respond to all these questions that's what a politician would get, and not a scientist. No, anyway, but you know, pick and choose a little bit, and I will try to see if you avoid something, and then we can get back to that. Uh, who would like to start? John, perhaps, or, and Madeleine? So John first, and then Madeleine. Um, so in, in research, we need good pieces. Somebody mm. has to make a vaccine. Mm. But then that vaccine is not sufficient to solve the, the problem it's no. to solve. So we, we have to figure out kind of how it's going to work. And, and, and so, you know, thinking about research in terms of specific components is fine, and we need good specific components, but we also need the research on political economy and system processes and things like that, and how to put them together is the real art. Mm. And part of that real art is to think about a few priorities for the long term mm. that okay. we can deal with in the short term. Um, and some of these are fairly obvious. I mean, climate change is obviously one because it's an urgent problem. If we don't get it sorted in the short term, we probably can't do anything about it in the long term. Mm. Um, there's a lot of demographic change that we can see, as you hear from Hans Rosling and other people, that are just obvious. And so we know that this is going to be a problem 10 or 15 years from now. So, so let's work on it now. Mm. Um, otherwise, 
yeah. So the pieces need to be put together, but we need good pieces. We need good vaccines. We need good diagnostic tests. We need good trees, seeds, etc. Would you say that the, the missing component quite often in terms of capacity, competence in the research community is those putting the pieces together? No, I'd say it's both. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's that mix of research in a country. I mean, somebody was talking about what do we do in African development. We need a mix of kind of very good competence on the technical things and then how it fits into the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Madeleine. Yes, um, very good questions there. Um, First of all, uh, I'm not saying that research and politics should be separated. I don't think that at all. I just, I just felt that the, the person to do that should not necessarily have to be the researcher himself. That's what I mean. And also, when we talk about researcher, even if we're, even if we are narrowing in here on only agriculture, we are very diverse. There are people that know how to study politics policy processes, and there are, then there are researchers that don't know how to study policy research processes, mm -hmm. or policy processes in general. So I'd just like to, it's a heterogeneous uh, group, and, and we chip in with what we know and what we can, and what mm -hmm. we have expertise in. So that's what I mean. And I definitely think that the long-term aspect of what you raised there, uh, Mark, is a really good question. And I think one of the challenges as a researcher is to convince policymakers that things takes time and, mm. and that is, it's not in this electoral period that it has to be fixed. So mm. I think that that's a really good question. Mm. Have, do, do you have an example, I mean, from your own career, you could say research career, where you have been able to really sell a long-term story uh, in a short-term context? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just wanted to try it and anyway. Ola, what is what are your perspectives on this? Yeah, well, um I just wanted to start by going a little bit back to what you opened this this session with, the, the agenda twenty thirty. If we look at the MGD one, it says we should by twenty fifteen we should half hunger and, and poverty. Mm. SDG two, um and uh, SDG one and two that replaces MDG one says that we should eradicate extreme poverty and we should end hunger. That's quite a significant increase in the ambition. Mm. And that means that we have a huge challenge ahead of us. Looking at agriculture, food production, we have seen here during these two days that it's a really bad actor when it comes to greenhouse emissions. We need to increase food production 70, 60 or 70 percent. Um, young people are running away from agriculture. Uh, we have a lot of examples of failed markets, failed supply chains, urban, rural areas. There's a lot of things we mm. need to work with. And I think we all need to take that extra step. And as an outsider, um, somewhat an outsider of the research community, being a bureaucrat, I said what I said before as, as a way where the research, where I see that the research community, by taking this extra step in assisting us as bureaucrats, to get changes done on the political level, mm. on decision-making level, that we can use the things that are coming out of research in a much more uh, concrete way. Mm. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. I'm, I'm not saying that every researcher should be an entrepreneur. Of course not. But I see um, a, a gap between research mm. and implementation and scale-up. And that's where I think we all need to work together to find the solutions. To have the intermediaries also, it could be as well. Of course, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Margaret, please. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, just very briefly speak to three of the questions uh, that were raised, because many interesting questions, but very little time. But because I started, I, I made the, com the comment on communicating science as an interesting arena for uh, that uh, science or uh, scientists can really begin to look at as perhaps a space to occupy. It is not. My point is not that scientists should be involved in the policy making process, but that when we do research as scientists, mm. um, we have robust evidence, we communicate that through our journals. Very segmented audience, but the world out there is full of so many other kinds of audiences who need to understand that science. Communicating science to the lay public, 
really reduces noise in terms of how such science can be co-opted for ends that were not initially intended. So it's a question of communication. Mm. And right now, the ways we are assessed as scientists, and this is just a challenge to the science community, is really usually through high impact factor journals, mm. which is great. But as we look at the challenges of that interface between policy, action, and science, should we, should, as, should scientists also be looking at communicating the results of science in, to different lay actors, lay public and so on, so that it's understood across the board. That's all, it's about mm. understanding the science and not about engaging directly in mm. a policy process. Uh, so I just wanted to make that contribution in responding to the kind of you know, issues we're discussing. Um, the, the, it was a very interesting question that was raised about family farms and the role of extension. Uh, Costas gave a very interesting uh, presentation here on family farms. At where I'm sitting, I'm looking at, okay, what, what, what is the meaning of family farms? How to unpack it from where I'm sitting as a daughter of um, a, a community that has a whole understanding of family farms very different than perhaps how it's understood in North America or understood in Europe. In my community in Sierra Leone, I would have a family of, of a husband who has several wives, and so you have semi-autonomous independent units nested mm. within a larger household. Is that a family farm? They're farmers. And so understanding that, or, you know, uh, really unpacking family farms and, and, and really getting to understand how, they, how the dynamic of those family farms in terms of production relationship, in terms of labor, in terms of income control, mm. uh, all the messy <laughs> arenas of agriculture. I think it's important to understand uh, uh, in, in, in that question. The whole question around extension is, is really interesting because it speaks to, we all recognize the, the failure of public extension systems. But in that vacuum that has been created mm. has been spawned very interesting models of extension. Online extension where in the rural non-farm environment, young people are taking interesting uh, opportunities. I am aware of a tool, an M farm platform in, uh, in West Africa that really generates a lot of agricultural information. Uh, the role of farmer associations, farmer organizations in the rural space. So there's no one model of extension, mm -hmm. but huge pluralistic models of expansion that can fit different needs uh, across the rural space. Thanks a lot. That's interesting. Again, it's not just one single answer. It's actually the complexity. Costas, uh, quite a lot of points that actually also touched upon what you discussed uh, in your, your presentation as yeah, well. Very, very, um, very interesting. I also take the point that Margaret just made. I, I thought if my presentation, the whole concept of family farming is debunked. It doesn't really provide you with any specific no. guidance. If 90% of the farms are family <laughs> farms and they span from less than one hectare to 20, so the idea was that, to, to, to look at the complexity. It just gave me the window of opportunity to look at the complexity of, of the whole thing. Um, it's the, the family farming and the international year of family farming is a political mm. construct, right? It doesn't have necessary operational, um, mm. very, very strong operational value. Some, some it does, but, but it's not as strong as, as people may think. Um, now, if you compare to the corporate, um, to the corporate farming, then you can find some, some general issues. But again, operationally, you have to, to get to the bottom of this. That's, that's the first point. Second, on the extension, I think it's the principles that I was talking mm, about, mm. right? How many players are now uh, into the extension relative to the ones that uh, they were uh, 20 years ago? Active players, right, mm. in the extension. The question is, there are some principles of what is the role of each one of them? Um, and, and from that, what is the role of the public mm. sector? To what extent the public sector could actually give incentives to the other actors to carry out some of the extension systems? The participatory approach that mm. Margaret was talking about. I don't have a, a model in mind no. which is of, of uh, overall validity. Finally, um, research and policy, right? Uh, the whole issue about the challenges in the SDGs at the end of the day will be 
um, live or die at the country level, right? To what extent some of those things, um, some of these cross-cutting issues uh, like nutrition or food security or um, are integrated into the sectoral policies because unfortunately um, governments make policies across sectors. That's, and the policy coherence that Jim was talking about is, rather, is the exception rather than the rule, right? You have government mm. ministries that, that are making policy on a particular sector, uh, influenced by major players in that sector. Mm. Now the research issue is who, and, and I hear, I, I said it from the beginning, I mean, the theory of change of research is not to um, necessarily for all participants in the research, um, in, in research to, to find its way into a policy process. That's probably FAO's job. Mm. Our uh, results framework, mm. theory of change says, to what extent our technical assistance to government mm. find its way to the policy process. That's mm. what we're gonna be account, and to do that, we use research, universities, mm. the CG system, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so one has to look at this issue of policy dialogue. What is the process in a country of policy making? Who are the, the major players? Which are the, mm. the so this is, you, you, you mapping this, the policy, the political space. Now this policy dialogue has two, two functions to it, or two parts to it. One is you carry, yeah, the, 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 the research into the policy process. The mm. other is you, you introduce new elements in the policy process, and there you need partners to do it, mm. because maybe governments won't do it. And the last thing, we shouldn't be very pessimistic or sarcastic about long-term versus short-term. Mm. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, governments do engage in long-term projects. I mean, it's not like a, a dead horse. And that's because political interests in the country have, a, 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 they have a, the political power to be able to influence government decisions mm. on long and short term things. Excellent, so you're not that pessimistic. Jim, there was also some questions specifically to, to yes. you as well. There was a very specific question in the back about uh, manipulating producer prices to enable young people to get into agricultural enterprises that they might not be able to otherwise. Um, I think I'm not an agricultural economist, and I'm very hesitant to say anything about price policy, but I think the question does um, highlight the importance of understanding uh, the problem of youth employment or employment for young people in agriculture in a broader perspective. So if in a national context, a government has more or less taken on its back and accepted uh, the idea of we're going to have, be an open economy, we're going to sign up for the WTO, we're going to limit the level of tariff barriers and so on, then it becomes much, much more difficult mm. to, at a later stage, be actively in there manipulating producer prices. So in a way, the, 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 um, the decision has been made some time ago to have a certain kind of economy, and that has serious implications for what what kinds of policy can be employed. We've, we've seen that in our own, we've studied uh, poultry in Ghana. And um, you know, there's, there's an active policy debate about how come the government isn't supporting the local poultry mm. industry. 90% of the, all the poultry in Ghana is now frozen chicken imported from Brazil and the Netherlands and the US. And the, the truth is that th it's the overarching macroeconomic policy mm. that mm. limits, it's not really a discussion about poultry. It's a discussion about what kind of economy you want to have, and that sets the stage for everything else. And that is also, I think, why it's really important to have a, a larger kind of political perspective on this, what look like little agricultural questions aren't just agricultural questions at all. No, I think, that, I mean, that, that is a very, very nice uh, point towards the end because, you know, it, it's, it's a bit like when you work on environmental issues in general, and, and you, you always, you know, head to the environment minister to try to get actions. But the, you know, the environment minister is just a trash can of everything else in society. Mm -hmm. I, mean, every, I mean, all the challenges that are related to environment are caused by other parts of society. So it's, it's, as you're saying, I mean, we are quite often looking at the wrong part of the system and, and try to address it while not looking at the really fundamental parts. I think that is a, it's a very interesting point. On extension, I think it's also interesting, Costas, I know we were talking about um, 
public sector a lot now. But of course, I mean, one issue for the future could also be very much what is the role of large corporations with supply chains where they are now, you know, they have millions of farmers maybe in their supply chains and they actually, to a certain degree, provide extension services, but with a, a very clear idea why. So I think, I mean, there, are, there is a dynamic there between sort of the public sector role and the private sector as well. Yes, in, in the 30 what, seconds. What I each. said, that yes. the public sector should find its role within the new constellation yes. of actors, right? <gasps> Including the large corporations, the private sector, etc. Exactly. That's exactly the point. Mm. Um, and Margaret, if you can keep it as short. Very, very briefly, because it's a very interesting point about the role of private sector as opposed to, and of course, look at the role of public sector. I will learn from what I know, countries and regions of the world that have been f remarkably successful in uh, using extension services to really drive uh, agricultural change on the ground, continue to value and support and promote a public role in mm. extension. Because there are public goods dimensions that the private sector is never going to deliver. Exactly. And uh, we look at the, the US, I always love to use the US model, my second home and uh, a model I admire tremendously. The public extension system is con continues to be the most important public institution. Mm. It's never going to change. Why should, and therefore, there should be lessons learned from emerging economies and countries of the South to ensure that the public role of extension is never replaced completely by private sector. Hmm. It's a huge risk, and, and we should not um, uh, forget that. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, now we're coming to the end of the panel discussion. I'm going to give you, uh, you know, 10 seconds to think a little bit here. I'm going to give you 10 to 15 seconds each, not to summarize or anything, but if you want to give an advice, say that the conference is organized one or two years again from now, we hope so. SLU Global, I think, has been uh, just assessed, um, and I'm sure the assessment will be very good. Siani, we are hoping, will continue two years from now also. We, we don't know yet. There's going to be an assessment of that as well. Hopefully, these kind of exact functions that you are talking about can continue to support conferences, for example, like this one. So if we are meeting here two, two years from now, give the organizers a recommendation of either a title of that conference, if you want to be that bold, or one specific subject that must be addressed. And please think a little bit transformative. That can be on a local scale. I mean, transformative are on all scales. But what would that be? And, and I understand you could speak for 10 minutes about this, but if you give them one piece of advice, what would it be? John, you, you look really determined already. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so I think, you know, when in the sessions, they were quite eclectic, so there was a big mixture of things. I think it would be very nice to choose a topic, and that topic can be anything, um, where you have a mixture of very specific technical research, political economy, how those can be connected, mm. and try and do that as a package, whether it's around climate change, whether it's around forests, but pick something and try and make those connections and maybe have three or four different cases. Excellent. I think that would be a nice one. Interesting. And, and then throw in one or two entrepreneurs in that session and yes, see them no, exactly. And, rush and off. Civil, yeah, that would ah, be very nice. That's great. So, Margaret, you still struggle a bit. That's fine. Ula? <laughs> well, um, I can, I can only uh, join, join in with, y with uh, you here, John. Um, I think a theme, 10 seconds, would be this interlinkage between uh, the different communities and how to work better together more mm. efficiently. That's great. Yep. So that's good. The catalyzers working together in communities. Madeleine, you look also prepared, sort of. Not, not really. Uh, I, I don't have a theme, but I was just thinking um, a little pad on our backs here, because I'm, I'm thinking... Uh, uh, who mentioned there was 6% of R&D in agriculture in southern, south, sub, um, in yeah. South, uh, yeah. Uh, and we're meeting here for two days and, and presenting a lot of good huh. research. And I think uh, one interesting thing as a, a thinking exercise could at least be, what would agriculture in a developing situation be without science? Good, turn it around. Show them the mystery it would be. Uh, Jim. Um, I don't think this is going to be very coherent, but it, following on from some of the sessions earlier today, it might be interesting to put out a challenge at the heart of the next meeting 
and really try to come to grips with the ah. discussion we've had about mm -hmm. how different kinds of data and different understandings of what is evidence and what is knowledge can be made to work together better, to come to grips with some of these questions about generalizability on the, on the other hand, context specificity. And as part of that, it, I think it would be really interesting is to test this hypothesis about big data is the new game in town. Mm. I would be really interested to see examples myself of how and if that kind of data can indeed be made to work to address the development problems that we've been talking about mm. over the last few days. That's great. Very nice. I will let you speak last, Margaret, because I give you the sort of final concluding remark there. So Costas. Can we have one session on a few brave people that they presented their work this year or last year to, take, to tell us what they've, they've learned from their piece of work and what kind of difference they think they've made mm -hmm. to whom. Just one session and pick some volunteers that will come up with ideas. I had this presented two years ago and now here I am and this is what I've learned and this is what I, the difference I think I've made. That's because good. a lot of the stuff that were presented here they were new ideas that could make a difference, hmm. or may not be a new, a new idea. There is a research piece. Just one session. That's nice. It's a nice way of following up what you actually have discussed before and what fails, what worked, you know, lessons learned. So, Margaret. Okay, I have the final word, but I'm not going to use the bullet pulpit to give another lecture. I would be very, very brief, but I, I think it's very, it's been very interesting the last two days, like this two days of this conference, lots of interesting discussions around the research for development. Mm. How do these two things come together? What I would love to see the next conference is really turning that around, research in development, mm. where we are getting very interesting case studies where such kinds of approaches, a, a bold, uh, uh, really risk-taking approach where you're putting, inserting research in the development context um, and, and really sharing some of those results would be very interesting. Thank you very much. What, a, what an extraordinary panel. I mean, you've been working extremely hard uh, for one and a half hour here, and we had three of the keynote speakers also just before the session. So you have really earned your dinner or whatever you will get tonight. I don't know. Who, who knows? Uh, but anyway, a warm applause.